वेलकम बैक टू दिस आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव एज यू नो इट्स अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट लेक्चर सीरीज टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू हैव दिस लेक्चर सो दैट मीन्स वी हैव कम्प्लीटेड दिस सिक्सटी फोर लेक्चर इन दिस सीरीज एंड आई वॉन्ट टू इन्फॉर्म टू दीकर दैट दिस सिक्सटी फोर लेक्चर दे हैव बीन डिलीवर्ड बाई वेरी एमिनेंट पर्सन and not only on agriculture research but also on policies on health issues on meditation uh, on motivation on entrepreneurship on many many wide uh, uh, wide topics for the benefit of our uh, students for the benefit of our agriculture universities professors and many more the icr policy makers so many senior persons they join on this platform so it's really uh, a, a great uh, moment that today again we have a very eminent person uh, we have uh, with us none uh, other than the world authority in the farmers rights uh, swanhil uh, isabel bata torim uh, we uh, i call her uh, bell uh, torim so uh, welcome uh, bell for this important lecture series and uh, this lecture series i can just tell you it's for a very important cause and uh, that is uh, we are going to have this to celebrate india's 75 years of independence which we are going to complete on 15th august 2022 uh, well this platform uh, is being used by our vice chancellors of the agricultural universities uh, being uh, you, uh, joined by many senior uh, officers the teachers the professors and uh, our uh, senior uh, officers from indian council of agriculture research and it is being live streamed also so mostly to the students uh, we uh, ask them to join through the uh, through the uh, live stream and uh, it is also live streamed uh, in the auditoriums where multiple students they just listen uh, what the speaker is saying uh, friends uh, let me just tell you um, briefly uh, about uh, Uh, madam uh, bell torim uh, uh, she is a senior policy advisor at the norwegian ministry of agriculture and food which she joined in 2013 her responsibilities are in the field of genetic resources biological diversity and sustainable development she is the national focal point for the international treaty on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture which we uh, call popularly as itpgrfa and the fao commission on genetic resources for food and agriculture which we call as cg uh, rfa and she also participates in other international processes such as the convention on biological diversity cbd the international union for the protection of plant varieties which we call as upop and the united nations food system summit she participated in the organizations of global consultations on farmers rights in ethiopia in 2021 2011 and in indonesia in 2016 she served in the bureau of the itp jrfa from 2015 uh, till 2019 and is currently co-chair of the expert group on farmers rights set up by the itp jrfa uh, along with me i am also the co-chair of this important ad hoc technical committee before joining the ministry she worked 6 years in the norwegian development fund on policy issues related to genetic resources and project support to community based biological management from 2005 till 2007 she was a junior professional officer at the united nations environment program in nairobi kenya she holds a master degree in political science from university of oslo and her thesis in a analyze the recognition of farmer sites in the itp jrfa she has a very uh, very vast contribution in the farmer sites and uh, she leads from the front uh, when there is a uh, issue of farmer sites she, she she takes the lead and uh, i have found her one of the uh, one of the very powerful lady to uh, to uh, say her uh, words to say her uh, messages and uh, today we have a very important topic Uh, which is a global issue which uh, we are uh, uh, we we often listen uh, that uh, the farmer sites are really very important so the the topic is farmer sites a cornerstone for food security and the management of the seed uh, diversity uh, 
as we know uh, without farmers rights we cannot have the food security because the kind of genetic drift or the genetic diversity which we can maintain through farmers rights is only possible and uh, uh, the same thing is true for the seed diversity so for getting this food uh, security and the seed diversity the farmers rights is a must and we have to listen uh, to uh, um, bell that how best we can uh, we can uh, inform to the public that why this uh, importance of farmers rights is there and also we can know uh, what are the, uh, the the different provisions in different countries and how uh, this particular rights are being implemented through the farmers uh, this itpjrf also so floor is yours uh, well and uh, you can take your own time and uh, then if you permit uh, in the uh, in, in the end we can have uh, some 10 minutes uh, discussion uh, to reply to the questions of the uh, the, the audience so thank you very much for joining and thank you very much for accepting our invitation and to be part of the india's uh, uh, celebrations for this 75 years thank you thank you very much once again please thank you thank you very much <laughs> thank you very much for the this invitation um and the opportunity to to tell about our jo joint work in fao on this matter and congratulations to india uh, in regard to your 75th year of independence that's coming up late, later in a couple of, couple of months and um, distinguished participants um uh, it's more time so apologies yes. for that uh, no. so we were about the history of farmers right as it was coined part of discussions in the 1980s um, and when the cbd was adopted in 92 it was agreed that uh, the undertaking should be updated to a legally binding instrument uh, to address particularly the issue on also farmers' rights, uh, because it was considered to be an outstanding issue. So the International Treaty uh, on Plant Genetic Resources of Food and Agriculture is an in international instrument for the management and conservation of crop genetic resources. The objective uh, of the treaty mirrors the objective of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which are conservation, sustainable use, and fair and equitable benefit sharing adopted to uh, plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. And farmers' rights uh, is a cornerstone in the implementation of the treaty. And it's recognized in, in Article 9, uh, where it says stresses that farmers are uh, guardians of genetic diversity. And Article 9 starts with saying that contracting parties recognize the enormous contribution that the local and indigenous communities of farmers of all regions of the world have made and will continue to make for the conservation and development of plant genetic resources which constitute the basis of food and agriculture production throughout the world. And these rights are also uh, um, recognized in, in the preamble, and there are many also other supporting, supporting articles in the treaty. Article 9 also uh, stressed that the responsibility for realizing farmers' rights rests with national governments. Uh, it mentioned possible measures, what contracting country, uh, countries can do to implement farmers' rights. And these are the protection of traditional knowledge, the right to equitable participate in benefit sharing, the right to participate in decision making. And it also addresses any rights that farmers have to save, use, exchange and sell farm saved seeds and propagating material. And uh, there are also supportive uh, provisions uh, in the treaty. Uh, for example, that in the preamble, it's also stressed the need to uh, promote farmers' rights also at the international level, uh, in addition to the national level. 
and Article 5 regarding conservation uh, says that contracting parties should promote and support farmers and local communities' efforts to manage and conserve on farm their crop genetics. And Article 6 on sustainable use um, have provisions for contracting parties to enhance sustainable use, promote participatory plant breeding, the use of local realities on farm diversity, and to review and adjust regulations on reality release and seed distribution. In order to kind of understand uh, farmers' rights, uh, Regina Andersen, a research professor at Fritjof Nansen Institute, has uh, suggested two, uh, two uh, different, uh, described two different approaches in understanding on, on farmers' rights. And she called this the stewardship and the ownership approaches. So when, when uh, genetic resources were considered as common heritage of mankind as provided in the international undertaking, um, where, where uh, genetic resources should be freely harvested, used and shared, that is a key, key uh, element of a stewardship approach. But with the emergence of biotechnologies in the second half of the last century, there was also then an increasing demand for protection of innovation from companies in terms of patents and plant clarity protection. And the Union for Protection of Plant Clarities was established in, in the 60s uh, with revision of its act in 78 and 91. And, and with the negotiation uh, in the World Trade Organization with the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights adopted in 94, uh, that is more a really a key ownership approach. And when demands for regulation on access and benefit sharing under the negotiations towards the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, adopted in 92, they followed uh, the logic of ownership approach, how they framed uh, their system on access and benefit sharing. So when the negotiations of the treaty was to be started, uh, after the adoption of the Convention on Biological Diversity in 92, it was a question how, how to combine the two. And uh, the two approaches to farmers' rights uh, could be further explained in, in this way. They are more uh, deliberately explained in Regina Andersen's publication, Realizing Farmers' Rights to Crop Genetic Diversity. Where the stewardship approach, uh, the goal is to protect farmers' crops, varieties, and knowledge from extinction, and thus to encourage their further use. And benefits are to be shared between custodians of agrobiodiversity and society at large through national and international measures. And legislation should shape and uphold the legal space for farmers to continue maintaining crop genetic diversity. The ownership approach, on the other hand, uh, the goals are to protect farmers' varieties and knowledge from misappropriation and enable its holders to make decisions over use. Benefits are to be shared between purported owners and buyers of genetic resources upon prior informed consent and on mutually agreed terms. Legislation should balance intellectual property rights for farmers, registration, registering their varieties with plant breeders' rights. So when looking at the different uh, possible measures uh, on, on farmers' rights, let me just quickly then share some of the examples uh, with having these classes on ownership and stewardship approach. Uh, protection on traditional knowledge. Uh, then uh, protection against extinction. Uh, is here a photo from Peru, where uh, a farm is showing a catalog of potato varieties. And by describing all the local varieties of potatoes within this catalog, uh, the knowledge uh, from the old elder people in the local community uh, are well documented uh, through te text and, and photos. Uh, and in this way, it supports helping to keep the knowledge uh, both about the varieties themselves and the use life. And um, 
Another example could be mentioned, uh, an approach is a community registry uh, in Bohol in the Philippines, uh, where they uh, register all uh, the local varieties. And by this establishing prior art uh, as a method for protection against misappropriation. Participation in benefit sharing is another element of, of farmers' rights, um, which means like sharing the benefits between the society at large and farmers who are contributing. And examples of non-monetary benefits could then be participatory plant breeding. And, and the photo up to the right here is from a release of a new bean potato uh, be, uh, bean uh, developed. Um, through participatory plant breeding in, in Honduras um, with the increased iron content. Um, another other examples are establishing community seed banks and seed fairs. And the photo to the bottom uh, right is from a seed fair in, in Malawi. Um, and in addition, you have capacity building and reintroducing traditional varieties and populations. All these are important measures for food security. Farmers rights to participate in decision-making at the national level uh, are, are also important of realizing farmers' rights. And um, an example from the photo here is, is the Norwegian farmers. Uh, we have a few farmers still uh, very keen on uh, growing traditional varieties and, and keeping them alive and enhancing our knowledge about their potential new uses. And obviously legislation in Norway uh, was amended in 2004, making it very rigid about which varieties that could be registered, making all traditional varieties illegal in a way. Um, but due to very active participation from, from farmers, uh, we made an amendment uh, to the seed legislation in 2010, which then also meant they led to the uh, end of the prohibition area of using traditional varieties. What is um, uh, maybe the most uh, debated uh, rights of, of farmers are farmers' rights to save, use, exchange, and sell farm slave seeds which um, could be understood that there's a need for creating legal space for farmers with regard to intellectual property rights and seed laws. Um, and it's important to have formal uh, and farmer seed systems both to make their contribution to the global genetic pool of food, pool and therefore also for food security. Uh, and a pioneering example in this regard is then uh, how India has adopted a joint PVP and Farmers' Rights Act in, in uh, more, more than 20 years ago. And it's still, uh, I think, the, the best uh, law, uh, trying to really create a legal space for farmers in terms of their right to save, use, exchange, and sell farm saved seeds. But so even though they are like examples of implementation of farmers' rights, in the early years of the treaty, it was little progress. Um, and on, on how to support contracting parties to, to implement Article 9. And in order to at least to have some uh, movement and, and enhancement in common understanding of what farmers' rights are, uh, there are the initiatives to have consultations. So our first uh, informal consultation was conducted in Zambia in 2007. Uh, and a quite a few participants participated there, looking into how to uh, different measures of uh, enhancing the realization of farmers' rights. But they could come when we look at the numbers of participants at the next uh, consultation. It seems that farmers' rights is increasing uh, in in um, in the awareness uh, and involvement of more. Uh, stakeholders and, and countries, and particularly when we come to the uh, next uh, global consultation that took place in, in Indonesia in 2016, uh, almost 100 participants from uh, all the uh, countries representing all the FEO regions uh, with many stakeholder groups and farmer representatives. And the purpose of this consultation was to create a space 
where a group of people representing major stakeholders could exchange views and experiences related to, to farmers' rights. And through this exercise, the organizers also hope that participants would get new ideas and inspirations on how to strengthen the realization of farmers' rights in their own countries, as well as contributing to a common understanding uh, of farmers' rights. And as a first step there, um, the conference uh, or consultations shared different uh, experiences on why farmers' rights matter uh, and, and documenting different examples uh, on how farmers uh, are custodians and innovators of seed diversity. And at the top, a uh, photo to the top there is um, Pepe, uh, a, a former um, secretary of the Commission on Genetic Resources, uh, who was heading the, um, the negotiation of the treaty sharing uh, a lot of experience from around the world, among others, when he met the melon farmer, uh, which is also on the photo here, uh, during his PhD studies. And uh, Pepe was collecting uh, di a diverse diversity of melons uh, when he uh, met this farmer on his way back from a field trip. Uh, and the melon farmer uh, uh, turned out to have um, Re uh, resistant rarities, uh, fungus resistant rarities, that, and this trait was later incorporated into commercial breeding program as one of many, many examples of how farmer seed systems are reservoirs of important plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. In addition, farmer seed systems are main sources of seeds in many countries uh, and important for local cultures. Uh, during the consultations, a lot of experiences on, on these typical uh, measures were, were shared, uh, and um, it was also clearly identified several challenges, how to further, uh, even though there are many like good, uh, more individual examples uh, on farmers' rights, um, there are really key, key challenges. And these include seed regulations, intellectual property rights, and um, there's a dominant focus on formal seed sector, neglecting farmer seed systems, lack of participation, and there's a need to document all this good, good practice and, and scaling them up. And there are limited technical capacity, need of guidance and, and support. So based, based on the deliberations, uh, the co-chairs uh, of the consultation, Carlos Correa from Argentina and Regina Andersen from Norway, compiled recommendations to the uh, governing body of, of the treaty, uh, which included a proposal to establish an expert group on farmers' rights. And this uh, led to, uh, I would say, contributed to the breakthrough for farmers' rights at the seven sessions in Sigali in 2017, because at that governing body meeting, um, all the contracting parties of the treaty agreed to the need to establish an um, ad hoc technical expert group on farmers' rights. And this was the very first time a formal intersessional process was agreed to. And the terms of reference was very clear to produce an inventory of national measures that may be adopted, best practices and lessons learned from the realization of farmers' rights as set out in Article 9 of the International Treaty. And based on the inventory, develop options for encouraging, guiding, and promoting the realization of farmers' rights. Um, so then the work, the group started to work. Um, we have had several meetings. Uh, I have had the pleasure of co-chairing this together with Rakesh. Uh, the group um, was very broad, uh, representatives, uh, more than 40 members from all the FAR regions, former representatives and, and stakeholders. Uh, and even though the terms of reference were very clear, how to make an inventory was up to us to uh, develop. Uh, and this slide show the evolution of the inventory. Um, so thanks to the Secretariat of the Treaty for providing this illustration. 
where we at the first, first meeting of the expert group um, reviewed different views and experiences and decided on a template for collecting information to make that everybody who submitted views and experiences should follow the same standard template of what kind of information that was useful for us to have. Um, and then we agreed to a structure for this inventory, uh, including uh, categories, which I will explain later. And at the second meeting, we managed to finalize a draft inventory, which, uh, which was presented um, to the eighth session of the governing body, and they endorsed the structure um, and um, uh, renewed the mandate so the expert group also could finish its work on options. Uh, and later now, the electronic version of the inventory uh, is finalized and now available on the website. And an updated version will be presented at the ninth session of the governing body. And uh, here is an illustration of how uh, the work of the expert group uh, is based. First, we request or invite uh, contracting parties and all other stakeholders to submit um, views and experiences under the realization of farmers' rights using the template developed by the group to include the history, content, achievements, lessons learned, etc. And all these examples become part of the inventory. And we group then all the different submissions under 11 categories. And based on this, uh, the group has developed options that are organized based on the same categories as in the inventory. And there might, are several options under each category. Uh, and the group has now developed uh, draft options for all categories, which I will uh, come to now uh, very soon. But first, these are the categories for farmers' rights measures. One is about the recognition on, on, of local and ind indigenous communities, uh, such as awards. Uh, second, financial contributions. Uh, three, to encourage income generating activities. And four, about uh, protecting of traditional knowledge uh, through catalogues uh, and other forms of documentation. Um, etc. Uh, so these are the different categories. All submissions uh, in the inventory are available under these categories. And under these categories, we have also then developed options. So if you search the inventory online, um, you, you will then find many different um, um, the different submissions. So far, more than two, two, 200 around 230 and there are room for more, more submissions. But let me then quickly um, turn to some of the challenges on farmers rights. One has been the focus on formal seed sector ne neglecting farmers seed systems. And the seed systems is a direct link between seeds, crop diversity and, and food security. And the formal seed system could be described in a linear system, like the orange to the uh, left, while the farmer seed system is a more holistic uh, system uh, with seed selections and uh, farm saved seeds being a key, key component. And there are uh, many different ways of then strengthening the, the informal or farmer seed systems, uh, while uh, the formal system is mainly uh, supported by le legal measures such as intellectual property rights. And uh, strengthening uh, their farmer seed systems could be, uh, could be considered a way to strengthen seed security. FAO has defined seed security as existing when men and women within the household have sufficient access to quantities of available good quality seed and planting materials of preferred crop varieties at all times in both good and bad cropping seasons. Um, and this is particularly the options under category six are addressing uh, these uh, 
um, th these elements, um, which is about establishing, for example, community seed banks, uh, organized uh, on support pharmacy seed festivals, uh, etc. Another challenge relates to seed regulations and intellectual property rights. And um, at uh, the eighth session of the governing body, it was a proposal by one contracted party that all options developed in the ex expert group should be in line with UPO 91. Obviously, obviously, it was no agreement to, to this. One is, of course, that it's a bit different membership, uh, which countries are adhering to the treaty and which are members of, of UPO. But also this uh, illustration of how to describe potatoes, it illustrates how uh, the UPO system is not so, uh, it's not sufficient to cover all the diversity there is. And so these illustrations are from a presentation by Simena Kadima from, from Bolivia about uh, their work on registration of farmers' varieties there. So the UPO descriptors of potato is to the to the left, um, to the bottom left, which doesn't really uh, provide a lot of differences. Um, well, uh, the more diverse uh, figures are from how the SIP uh, describe the different shapes of potatoes. Um, but still, there are some um, interesting processes in, in, in UPERF uh, looking into how to expand uh, the possibilities of farm saved seeds. Um, Article 15.1 uh, uh, in the UPO Convention says that acts done privately and for non-commercial purposes um, are exempted from um, the breeders' rights, uh, meaning that uh, farmers, if they do save seeds uh, from their harvest, and it's, you could consider it private and non-commercial, uh, they should continue to be allowed to do so. Um, and there is a process uh, initiated by um, Plantum, which is a Dutch uh, seed uh, sortium, Oxfam and Euroseeds, to expand this understanding. But still, it is very limited when you look at the need for legal space for farmers' rights. Um, and which is also uh, got the interest of the, um, the special rapporteur on the right to food, Michael Fakri, and he also shared his um, perspectives uh, on farmers' rights in regard to, to UPOV uh, and other elements as, as well. Uh, so uh, if you recall very briefly that from the very beginning in 1983, when the undertaking uh, was uh, adopted, there was some uh, reservation by OECD countries linked to land variety protection. And still, this is um, one of the um, outstanding issues to find further uh, common ground among contracting parties in the treaty. Because category 10, legal measures, um, the expert group did not manage to finalize its work so what will be presented uh, to the governing body session uh, in September will be uh, options drafted by, by as a proposal by the co-chairs. Uh, just a quick note on the challenge of financial support. There is also one category addressing this, uh, for example, encouraging uh, voluntary contributions to the benefit sharing fund of the international treaty. And I put a photo of the small but global seed vault up to the right, because at the this is uh, the small but global seed vault is a backup uh, of the world's uh, gene bank collections, um, and uh, is is really part part of the ex situ part uh, of uh, the conservation system. But at the official opening in two thousand eight, Norway wanted to stress the. Uh, the complementarities uh, and need also for in situ on farm conservations. And ever since, um, they have contributed annually to the benefit sharing fund. And just recently, uh, the secretary of the treaty, Kenton Dorsey, was in Norway, uh, and uh, the Norwegian state secretary uh, announced again the annual contribution to the benefit sharing fund. So, uh, apologies for running late. Um, 
here, and this is my last slide now, uh, because what is next? We have now the uh, draft options to be considered uh, at the next session of the governing body. Um, the uh, host country, India, has uh, suggested celebrating the guardians of crop diversity uh, as a theme uh, for this session. And I, I couldn't think about a better, a perfect way of then uh, have further discussions on, on farmers' rights. Uh, where contracting parties will take a decision whether to adopt the draft options document and maybe also consider what could be other means of promoting the realization of farmers' rights. How to progress further? Should there be other new consultations? Um, is there a need to develop guidelines as the options are very brief uh, and further need of capacity buildings. All these are questions that the contracting parties together with other stakeholders and farmers representatives will dwell into when we meet in, in New Delhi in, in September. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I look forward to questions if there might be anyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Bell, for for giving an overview of uh, what's going on uh, in different countries, what's going on uh, under the TT, what's going on uh, in the UPOB. And you have nicely covered, I think, uh, as a cornerstone, uh, the importance of these farmer sites as per the provisions of the TT. And uh, the, the Article 5 uh, about the conservation and the other articles which are, uh, which are connected with these farmer sites and this TT. And uh, you have rightly told uh, the, the Regina's viewpoint, stewardship and ownership, really, uh, they are the two important approaches uh, to stop the extinction or to give the, the legal rights uh, to the farmers. So a lot of things, even about the traditional knowledge, uh, even for the benefit sharing, and the most important uh, provision for the farmer sites, that how we can give the rights to the farmers for saving, using, and exchanging uh, these farm uh, seeds and even to sell it. So all those things which the India is proud of. India has really uh, enacted the law and has a, a balance of uh, breeder sites uh, and these farmer sites. That's really uh, something uh, which we are the forerunner and which we have taken a lead uh, from the Indian side. And you have covered even the challenges, what are the formal challenges, and I, I fully agree. In the next uh, GB meeting, which India is going to host in the month of uh, uh, September, uh, we, have, uh, we have to uh, just decide that what is the future course of action to implement these farmer sites. As per the recommendations of this ad hoc technical expert group, and uh, based on the further directions from this governing body. So uh, uh, it's really a dream uh, for uh, all of us to realize the farmer sites across the world. And let us see how globally we can uh, adopt this and give importance to the farmers so that we can have the food security, we can have the, uh, the, the conservation of the seed diversity. That's really uh, something uh, we are looking for. Uh, we have a few uh, questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Sunil is asking, uh, we have uh, a balance of farmer sites and of the breeder sites which are coexisting in India. Why is such thing are not being adopted by the other countries uh, across the world? Uh, you have any viewpoint, uh, Bell, about this? Could you, could you please kindly repeat the questions? Uh -huh. I didn't get the phone. Yeah. Dr. Sunil Archak, he's asking, when there is an example of farmer's rights and breeder's rights, uh, which are coexisting in India, why more countries are not coming forward to have uh, this example of farmer's rights? A very good question. There are, I think there are a few, uh, uh, India law, it is a PMA law, um, but there, there are a few other countries having similar elements, particularly mm. in Asia countries, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, et cetera. Uh, who have a sui generis uh, plant variety protection. Um, 
but I think it is uh, like uh, easier maybe that maybe the youth of convention is more known and maybe it's also more actively promoted. So maybe this is a challenge for, for India that you could maybe share more your experiences yeah. because I think it's very valuable <clears throat> lessons learned for other countries. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now people, uh, one of our audience, Dr. Partha, is interested to know something uh, about uh, this uh, Svelberg Global uh, uh, Facility in the Norway. Uh, okay, yes. So Svelberg Global Seed Vault uh, was established by the government of Norway um, and it opened in 2008. And, and the purpose is to provide uh, a possibility and offer to the gene banks of the world to have safe, safe duplications of their collections. And, and Norway run this uh, seed vault together with the Nordic Gene yes. Bank and Crop Diversity Trust. Um, and uh, so all gene banks around the world, uh, national, international, local are invited to and send safety duplications of their seed to the seed vault. The conditions are on black box conditions, meaning it's only the gene bank depositing the seeds <clears throat> in there who will be allowed to withdraw them. So it is part of a really bad backup system. Uh, and mm. then with the understanding that um, the gene bank collections, availability to the gene bank collections should be through the gene bank themselves. Good. Uh, Dr. Sharma is asking, uh, do you have some case studies uh, in the developed nations uh, regarding the farmers' rights for protection against the innocent infringement? Uh, you can see in the chat box uh, the, the last question. Uh -huh. uh, innocent infringement. Um, uh, that means if they uh, innocently, uh, in a way, use protected material. Uh, in India, we have uh, this uh, provision of innocent infringement. Yeah. So uh, if uh, a farmer uh, is uh, is innocently. Uh, infringing the rights of any breeder. So if he's selling uh, the protected variety or if he's selling some uh, IPR protected uh, seed, so he cannot be sued in any court of law. So do you yeah. have some, uh, such examples uh, in the developed countries? I'm, I, I, I'm not aware of any specific other example, uh, but I will not exclude that then there might be. Uh, mm. And since India has this uh, specific measure, I would also encourage you to, to submit it explicitly to the inventory on particularly this, this topic, because then it will be searchable for others um, as well. Yeah, it's a very good uh, vision, and uh, uh, we, we cannot uh, uh, ask any farmer uh, to go to the court and then uh, uh, spend the money to protect themselves. So that's really very good uh, provision. Yeah. Oh, what is quite you. often claimed, at least, yeah. is that there are very few cases where companies or have actually sued farmers in the global south. Um, Thank you. So this is uh, these are issues also a bit linked to the discussions in in YEPA when we are looking into how possible to uh, broaden the scope uh, of Article Fifteen One on what could be considered. Um, private and non-commercial, because uh, if subsidence farmers they use and exchange seeds, it could be considered non-commercial since it's at such small scale. But there are different views among UPO members, so we will see how far that process will go. Good. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Bell, for uh, replying to the questions and for uh, uh, giving the response to the queries, to the questions of our audience. And our audience, uh, they are really uh, a very learned audience. Uh, they have a lot of experience uh, about the, uh, the importance of the farmer's rights. 
so uh, we look forward for uh, more insights uh, in the future and uh, i know it is too early uh, early morning in the norway but still you could uh, find time and maybe you are on leave uh, so thank you very much for sparing time and for being part of this 75 lecture series of india uh, for this uh, for, to celebrate the independence and uh, thank you thank you once again on behalf of my all uh, participants audience Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity and congratulations again on your celebrations. And uh, thanks to India for, for hosting the next session of the governing body.